Hello, hello everyone. Happy Friday. Yay, Friday. Ah, can you believe it's already Friday? Can you believe it's already Friday in almost the end of December? I I am 100% in shock. Like I feel like this just crept up on me. I totally expected that uh yeah, I totally expected this this month to go way, way, way slower, but it's flying by. And um, I'm actually looking forward to a weekend of just, I want to say rest, but that's not actually the right word. Respite, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's a busy day. Anyway, um, today we have a, another, I hope this is going to be really interesting. I'm actually really looking forward to this because the paper that we're going to go into um, is all of a sudden I got all fuzzy. I don't know what just happened. So I was nice and crystal clear. And then all of a sudden it got fuzzy. Am I fuzzy to you too? Cause it looks fuzzy for me. Anyway, um, we're just going to keep going. You're just going to have to deal with my fuzziness. All right. So, um, last week, if you remember, we went through, uh, the report on toward a plant advocacy movement. I want to thank Paul Moss because he actually listened to the commentary and sent me a long article with some really interesting points that I'm excited. I'm kind of chewing through and I will be sharing to you. I already talked about one of them in a post. So if you haven't seen that, please go back to that post. It's a post about the um, concept of the plant advocacy movement and the animal advocacy movement movement and the conflict between them. And I have to say, I did not realize that we had this conflict. Like this is, this is something completely sort of came out of left field for me. I, I just did, did not expect this fuzziness is starting to really bother me. And I don't know why, why is it fuzzy? Um, we're gonna, we're, we're, we're technical folks here. I'm gonna see. Oh, look, now I got clear again. Okay. So maybe, it, maybe it did work. I, 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 I didn't even do anything, but I, okay. Anyway, I feel like it just got fuzzy and then it got light again and then it's going to get fuzzy and it's going to get light again. So you're just going to have to deal with this for right now because I don't know what's going on anyway. Um, uh, but yeah, but so this, uh, his commentary, his comments on my comments were really fascinating and interesting. And I'm really looking forward to diving deeper. Some of them I am, um, still digesting because I want to, kind of think about them before I share them with you. I did love the fact that he was in agreement that we kind of have a more bottoms up approach here in uh, NCC and that as sprouts, we're very much into the idea of living this shared experience with plants and where kind of the academic world is on the top down and thinking about it first and then putting it into practice. Both of them are totally necessary, as I said last week, but um, I think it's really useful and important and fun that um, for us to think about ourselves as allies that are kind of going in these two directions to meet in the middle um, with our plant friends. Anyway, if you haven't seen that yet, please go and check it out. This is last week's Towards a Plant Advocacy Movement. Instead, today, as I said in my message, we are going to be heading back towards the more biological perspectives in reality into plant molecular science and into the foundations of plant intelligence. I chose this after going through a whole series of things for two reasons. One reason is because I am hoping to get a little bit more into the biology again. I feel like I like the swing that has been happening between us, between biology and really understanding the more technical aspects of our plant friends and how our plant friends um, kind of live and are just the same as um, just the same as we think about ourselves and trying to understand our own physiology. So I have one aspect that I swing through there. And then the other aspect that I swing to the more cognitive or even more relational or humanities perspectives of our relationship with plants. So I want to keep doing this swing. And I think it's important. I have a few papers queued up that I want to talk about that are a little bit more on the biological technical side. They're around plant movement and such. And only because I feel that sometimes some of us feel like we are not um, wonderful plant advocates or plant stewards because we do not understand a lot of the technical jargon. And, and that's fair. I mean, it's not because I don't think it's actually necessary, but for some reason it feels like 
not understanding anything about the physiology or the biology of our plant friends. It's almost like not understanding, I don't know, that humans have two hands and two legs or, you know, that, that, that humans generally operate in some way. And so therefore you don't feel comfortable in talking about humans without understanding at least some of the biology of our plant friends. It's hard for us sometimes to feel confident speaking up, especially in public circles or when we're talking with groups of people. So my goal always here, and please, please give me your comments and let me know what you think about this. But my goal is always to sort of flow in between giving you enough information about the biology so that you feel um, like you can discuss it if it comes up. And at the same time, not too much that we feel like we all have to become plant molecular biologists or some sort of plant plant botanist, but biologist and all those different things. I think these are two different aspects. But because I have a few papers and a few different ones that I want to kind of step a little deeper into how plant movement works, how plant signaling works, and then that way we can extrapolate from there what that means for us as humans and as, as allies and friends, then I want to go back to the Foundations of Plant Intelligence, um, which is the paper we're going to go into today. The other reason I want to go into this paper is because this one is 2017. Now, if you've been following along with us for a while, or if you want to go back and look through the archives, you'll see that we started this, this journey together through plant consciousness and plant intelligence way back in papers that started around 2006, 2007, 2000, and we've gone, 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 gone forward. There's lots of information going on. So because this is 2017, which is not that many you know years ago, obviously, this is a way more updated to the latest findings of that period. So where some of the ones where we talked about the foundations of plant intelligence in other aspects were a little bit older and therefore was what we knew. This is a science that is just developing rather rapidly right now. And therefore, being able to periodically step in with what is the latest we understand about how the plant mind works, I think always helps us um, have the best conversations um, with the most up to date information. So this is a paper that was written by Anthony Trawabath. Let me just share my screen for you. And oh, here we go. Okay. There we go. So this is a paper that um, by the Royal Society of Publishing, this came out um, in, as I said, 2017 in Interface Focus. And this is um, the, the foundation, pretty simple. The title says it all, The Foundations of Plant Intelligence by Anthony Trawabas. We love Trawabas. I mean, we've, we've studied a lot of different things that Trawabas has said. Um, he is in uh, Scotland. He is a just somebody who has been extremely prolific in his reminding us that plants are intelligent beings and that plants are persons and really um, being on the forefront of helping us reshape or helping especially the academic world reshape the way that they think about them about plants and especially in the whole world of kind of the cognitive sciences and how plants are starting to enter into this so I feel like this is going to be a really good um, overview I haven't yet gone into it but let's just let's just dive in together intelligence is defined for wild plants and its role in fitness identified intelligent behavior exhibited by single cells and sis and systems similarly between the inter the interactome and connectome indicates neural systems are not necessary for intelligent capabilities. Now, this whole conversation about, as you know, because we've gone through this, right, plant neurobiology, everything relating to neural kind of development has been a hot, hot, hot topic around the intelligence, around what intelligence means with the neurobiological world, the human biological world, neurobiological world, really pushing hard for a definition of um a definition of intelligence that is connected to a nerve, a central nervous system and to neurological pathways in a very tradition, human animal centric way, where instead the whole plant neurobiology world is that no, we have different 
plants have different things, different types of uh, biological mechanisms, but that act very simple, similarly to neural pathways. So you do not have to have neural systems in the traditional sense in order to be intelligent. Um, intelligence has developed in many different ways. And this has actually gone down a few different paths simultaneously with some saying, that plants have their own mechanisms, but they're neural-like, with others saying, look, let's just take this whole neuro conversation completely out because it's creating confusion and it's creating a lot of um, uncomfortableness and a lot of arguing. Let's just say plants are intelligent as plants and they have completely different systems with different naming schemes. And this is why I keep talking about how vocabulary is so important right now. Many of our conversations are about adding the word phyto or plant in front of something that we we have historically thought of for animals or humans and humans because I always forget when we're talking that humans are animals and so when should we come up with a completely different word that better describes what plants are doing even if the ultimate experience is analogous to what humans or and animals are doing this this is still a, a hot open point of contention so plants sense and respond to many environmental signals that are assessed to competitively optimize acquisition of patchily distributed resources. Situations of choice engender motivational states in goal-directed plant behavior. Consequent intelligent decisions enable efficient gain of energy over expenditure. Let me be very clear in this paper. This paper is going to be probably dry, just, just so you know. It's going to be dry because of the audience and it has to be dry because it's almost in order to be taken seriously needs to have this sort of dry approach just just saying some of them have been a little sassy some of them have had a little bit of like oomph to them i don't know if this one will i think it's going to be boring but that's okay because i'm going to make it fun um comparison of swarm intelligence and plant behavior indicates or sorry where am i indicates the origins of plant intelligence lie in complex communication and is exemplified by cambial control of branch function. Um, cambial control of branch function, right? So the cambium la layer of, of plants, which is right what's underneath the kind of bark or outer coating. Error correction in behaviors indicates both awareness and intention as does the ability to count to five. Vol is he gonna talk about counting? This is gonna be interesting. Okay, maybe it will be a little bit more interesting than I thought. Volatile organic compounds, or what's called VOX, are used as signal as signals in numerous plant interactions. Being complex in composition and often species and individual specific, they may represent the plant language and account for self and alien recognition between individual plants. I have to say that I, um, I, I passed over a paper that I was going to talk about that talked about the language of plants in the sense of the volatile organic compounds only because as I was just sort of scanning it really quick, it was so freaking technical. It's interesting from the perspective that if you're trying to understand the syntax of one potential plant language, volatile organic chemicals or Vox are definitely one of the most scientifically agreed upon languages that plants use to share experiences. And if you've ever had something like The Companions by Sherry Tepper, you know that there are probably other ways of communication, other sort of compositions to languages that really step very far outside what humans would consider a, a form of communications. I mean, we're used to things like gesture, we're used to words, we're even used to maybe emotions, but a lot, or pictures, all of those come in. When you're talking about a chemical language, notwithstanding the fact that we as humans experience it, because we really do, if you think about it from the perspective of pheromones and hormones and how much attraction and all these types of things are based on what is coming through an olfactory system, but yet we don't have it as a codified language, so we don't talk about it in that form. Where plants, of course, talk about it all the, all the time because it is one of their primary language ways. And it's one of the primary languages they use to interact with us, which is something we don't think about consciously very often. Um, the smell of grass, a beautiful rose, um, all of the essential oils that you use are those combinations of scent or uh, organic compounds 
um, that are being shared or, you know, terpenes and many uh, different compounds that plants produce that have a different way of entering into our system and being a form of language. We just don't think of that as conscious language because we as humans don't use it in a conscious way. It is un still an unconscious way. But from a plant perspective, it is a conscious form of language. It is a way that they put together different information and pass that on to another being, which could be another plant, it could be a human, it could be a, and another kind of animal or any other kind of, of, of being out there or another kind of um, um, species. Game theory has been used to understand competitive and cooperative interactions between plants and microbes. Some unexpected cooperative behavior between individuals and potential aliens has emerged. Behavior profiting from experience, another simple definition of intelligence, requires both learning and memory and is indicated in the priming of herbivory disease and abiotic stress. Now, why is it that Trawawas is putting a special emphasis on this? In order for us to get into a conversation with a wider public about the idea of plants as persons, plants as um, um, beings, we have to step into a common defined and agreed upon definition of intelligence. We have to really get to the idea that plants are not just behaving, but they're behaving with intention. They're behaving from a place of decision making, of memory. Now we've talked about this over and 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 over again here in so many of the papers. But that doesn't mean that there is a standardized definition yet. And it is for some people still a hot point of contention. Nobody denies that plants react to their environment. But there is still, and you will see this in the discussion between um, uh, Marco Martyr and Francione that I published around the idea of plant advocacy versus animal advocacy, that this notion that plants respond and are aware of their environment for the plant advocacy, for the animal advocacy world in some cases is still just considered to be mechanical. It's considered to be automatic. It is not considered to be a telltale sign of intelligence. So this paper is really about resetting the foundation of intelligence based on the latest information that we have up until 2017. Problem of perception. The earth is a planet dominated by green plants. I don't see a problem there. <laughs> I'm sure they'll get it. They account for over 99% of, uh, I hate this word because I always pronounce it weird, eukaryotic eukaryotic life as the ratio of atmospheric oxygen to carbon dioxide estimated at 660 indicates but in the area of behavior and intelligence investigation is almost entirely limited to those of animals to most animal scientists plants seem to do nothing good examples of still life this is where i always have to take a breath and remember that Troy Wallace is on our side and that this is just him stating what is believed. Being animals ourselves, behavior and intelligence are expected to involve movement within our time frame. It is not easily visible, it is assumed to be absent. This is a great line. It's not easily visible, it's assumed to be absent. I think we use that, unfortunately, in so many aspects of our lives. If it's not easily invisible, it's assumed to be absent. We can, that could be something that we can use to better, better think about other aspects of life too. A further assumption is that behavior and intelligence requires a nervous system. This is what I was talking about before. Something that has been called brain chauvinism. Brains or nervous systems are not, however, needed for intelligent be behavior as indicated later. They happen to be the route evolution charted for rapid movement and essentially rapid assessment of circumstances by animal organisms. Assessment of circumstance is, however, an equally crucial for plants. And this is where Trawabas is really trying to plant a, a very important stake in the ground, which is that we need to start thinking that every single organism, major, especially king home or kingdom, depending on how you, what word you want to use, has developed their own way. Microbes have developed their way. Fungi have probably developed their way. Plants have developed their way. And humans have developed, or animals have developed their own way. And if we were to see these as like independently um, 
developing ways, then we would recognize that the brain is just one of many different mechanisms. But for some reason, this still is extremely difficult for people to accept and understand. When the first plant acquired a blue-green alga with the evolutionary time morphed into a, a, a chloroplast, it also required a relatively rigid wall to constrain the generated osmotic, osmo osmotically active products, which can produce turgor pressure. So this is, go look at plant cell biology. This is just the basics of cell bi biology, right? The way that the cell is, is inhibited and the way pressure moves and how plants have grown and how they um, movement is based on this pressure that's happening from one side to the other. But, but the wall inhibits easily flexible uh, flexibility and movement. Since light energy was relatively ubiquitous, rapid movement never became an evolutionary imper imperative. Once on land, multicellular plants used the wall as the skeleton and growth was limited to small regions. When wall strength was relaxed to permit division of, and cell expansion, in the present day plants, there, these are tip stems areas in root and shoot the cells and tissues this is oh good wow like an amazing instructor of plant biology i have the entire i have the image in my head i have to admit that it's not my strength to try to explain it so well so if you're very curious about how plants move i highly recommend that you just do a quick search on like plant physiology and it'll give you that information um, the way that the meristems like the tip meristems work and the the little area of the roots that have kind of a piece of decision making with neural like neuron like um chemicals in it. There's a lot of different pieces to understand and learn that are not hard. I'm going to say this, they're not hard. They seem hard, but they're actually not hard. But um, it would take me a while to try to explain it into, I'll do my best as we go. If there's words that specifically, you know, if there's areas that you think are actually important, I'll stop and I'll do some Google search and I'll find, but might be easy for you to do a Google search. In the present day plants, uh, like I said, there are tip meristems, embryonic areas in root and shoot that generate new cells and tissues. The root meristem is about five millimeters long and the shoot about double that. Like all organisms, plants must acquire um, the resources they need to grow. They need to deal with predators and disease and find mates. Instead of movement, the competitive fight for the essentials, light, minerals, and water, led instead to fights over space. Branching structure with tip growth was the obvious solution. It provided the potential for maximum space occupation, resource acquisition, and in turn helped deny resources to nearby competitors. Fierce competition for light drove plant evolution upwards in height and a new meristem, the cambium, to increase girth. The cambium is the level right under the bark or right under like the outermost layer. Resources for both plants and animals are rarely uniformly distributed. Just as the roving animal locates potential food and moves toward it, growing plants have to identify the locations of richest sources of resources in their surrounding space and grow towards and capture them. In this situation, growth acts like very slow movement. However, growth is very slow in all organisms and does not result in obvious and visible change, which is why plant behavior is often um, uh, discounted which is true, right? It's, it's like you don't notice how, it's funny, um, over the last two years, I have been very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Attentive to the plants that, the, to my plant housemates, to the different plants that share this house with me. And I have been amazed at the, the amount you recognize in how they change and grow. I'm specifically looking at this one cactus plant that I have, that I have, that lives with me, that is right here in front of me, that is one of the plants that I can notice movement throughout the course of the day. This plant has a very long main stem up, and therefore throughout the course of the day, circ circumambulates, I think is how you say it, and moves around and I can really see it. Where many of the other plants, it takes me a while to recognize the growth. But wouldn't that happen to any human around me too, right? Whether they're gaining weight or losing weight or getting in height or 
growing a beard, there are some things that I notice very quickly, just the same as I do with plants, and there are some things that it takes me a while before I recognize that something has changed. I mean, even in ourselves, right? You're more likely to know that you've gained weight or lost weight based on how your jeans feel than because, or how your pants feel, than because you actually really recognize those small movements. But when it comes to plants, we sort of almost assume that they don't move because we don't see it. So when it comes to human, there's an innate understanding that it's happening. But when it comes to human, because they walk around, we don't look at that kind of growth. But in plants, because they don't walk away around, we don't see that kind of growth. Think about that for a minute. Hmm. Ooh, excuse me. But the skill required to efficiently and even maximize capture of resources is no different between animals and plants. The plant phenotype is plastic and reflects in part its environmental history. So the phenotype is the part of the, the genotype is what comes from genes and is static and the phenotype is really about the expression of those genes and how that is plastic in the sense that it's very malleable, it's changeable, a lot more so than we as humans. Um, but it's not always growth. Motor cells in very limited areas of the plant do use turbo pressure to change the phenotype, often reversibly. In, a very, in very few species, these turbo changes do lead to visible movement and behavior. But for most plants, turbo movement are, again, too slow and below our, below our ability to easily see. So he's just setting kind of up that just because plants aren't necessarily visibly moving around doesn't mean that there aren't changes happening. And this is gonna set the foundation for what he's gonna go into relating to what does intelligence really look like. Agreeing with a uniform definition of intelligence, okay. I consider that intelligence in both animals and plants is concerned with improved survival in the wild and thus in turn fitness. A compendium of different descriptions and attributes of intelligence has been published. These descriptions hinge around the, the ability of organisms to solve problems experienced during the life cycle. Behavior that profits from experience through forms of learning and memory and improves survival and thus potentially, potentially fitness are considered intelligent. Perhaps the most useful summary of that is, is that of Legg and Hunter. They collected some 70 different definitions of intelligence and summarized them as follows. Intelligence. One is the property that an individual has at its, as it interacts with its environment or environments. Two, is related to the agent's ability to succeed or profit with respect to some goal or objective. Three, depends on how able the agent is to adapt to different objectives or environments. Pretty good definitions. Category one, this is simply behavior. In plants, behavior is concerned with the phenotypic and molecular responses to changes in a multitude of environmental and internal signals. So the plant interacts with the environment in which the plant lives in, then the plant makes decisions on which way to go. So category two, the goal for, remember category two is related to the agent's ability to succeed or profit with respect to some goal or objective. The goal for any wild organism is ultimately fitness and is equated, and that doesn't mean going to the gym, by the way, it means being fit, being fit to survive, and is equated to numbers of surviving siblings. The ability to profit from learning and memory and thus improve subsequent behavior increases the chances of survival of the individual. Darwin considered selection to take place at the level of the individual. The whole life cycle is subject to overall selection and fitness, and intelligent behavior becomes a critical part of subsequent fitness. Category three, the linking. So this is the third, which is the agent's ability to adapt to different objectives or environments. So being able to really adapt to what's going on. The linking with environmental variation is crucial here. What is intelligent in one environment may not be so in another. For plants, it is the ability to improve behavior or experience and thus be adaptively variable through a multiplicity of different environments while continuing development throughout the cycle. 2.2, there are numerous short descriptions of intelligence in literature. Some will be mentioned later in this article. Adaptability, uh, adaptively variable behavior within the lifetime of the individual is a simplification that agrees with the definition above and used previously by me. 
The emphasis here is adaptively variable. Adaptation represents improvement in subsequent behavior as a result of life cycle experience. I want you to remember that definition for yourself. We talk about adaptation so much, about our ability as humans to adapt and how much we can learn about healthy adaptation, not the same as conditioning from our plant friends. So I just want you to kind of like take that and put it into a little cubby hole somewhere in there. Because if you go through, for example, the podcast, you'll see me talk about adaptation quite often. And you'll often see me talk about adaptation in the sense of health and in the sense of how you deal with change. Adaptation is an extremely important process for all beings. And we can learn a lot from our plant friends because their method of adaptation is much more evolved and much more more um, efficient than what we as humans use. Often we as humans kind of fall into the idea of conditioning, which is not the same as adaptation. Adaptation is active and it's decision-making based where conditioning is passive and it's based more on um, unconscious behaviors. So just a little aside. Adaptive behavior that is expressed with greater rapidity, higher probability, or lower cost, or in summary, improved efficiency during the life cycle is more intelligent and should help place the individual at one or more fitness peaks in, a, in an adaptive landscape. Clarifying the, distinguish, the distinction between plant development and behavior. Behavior is not to be confused with the acts of development which are essential to the individual's survival and reproduction. A good example here, many others will follow later, is seed germination. Without it, the individual does not develop at all. But when the seed germinates, as it act, is when, but when the seed germinates is an act of adaptive variability or plasticity and thus potentially intelligent and characteristics. Ooh, this is really interesting. This is interesting for a few other things that I'm working on. In the soil, many wild seeds are fully imbibed. Germination in some seeds only advances when dormancy is broken, when the seed is in a receipt of a plethora of signals which are then assessed and judged to be beneficial for the seedling and later developing plant. The skill in environmental interpretation, that is learning, determines which seeds will most accurately assess the time of germination and environmental conditions for the young plant. These are clearly the most intelligent. Think about this for a second, right? We all know this, you place a bunch of seeds out and only some germinate. Why? Because only those have regarded that the conditions both inside of the seed, in other words, what is it that the seed has in order to, to survive this um, first piece when the seed breaks out of the dormancy period, when it breaks out of the shell, and also what are the conditions in which that seed has been placed or has arrived in, are is um, only the ones that feel for whatever reason that they can survive that kin are able to make it into this world it, are those the ones that are going to germinate that's intelligence right you have to make a decision that's an intelligent behavior signals that are assessed at a limited range of local temperatures to indicate a suitable season of either summer autumn or winter which is usually counted as a number of days below 4c for centigrade, water availability, very various soil volatile organic comp, uh, compounds, perception of light, age of seed, a phenomenon often called a phenomenon called after ripening and not understood. Hmm. Soil minerals and probably others not yet determined. Then, in addition, maternal environmental conditions influence the decision of daughter seeds on the timing of germination too. That is to grow immediately or to remain dormant. These conditions include the maternal experience of carbon dioxide levels, competition with other plant species, day length, fungal infection, growing season length, light quality, mineral nutrition, position in the ovary, defoliation, and time of seed maturation. The maternal learning experience, by maternal learning experience, this means the experience of the mother tree that gave that seed. That's what we're talking about, my maternal. The maternal learning experience is passed on to the next generation through obvious memory. Maternal condition influences on germination are predictions of likely future environments in which the siblings grow. 
Sibling phenotypic characteristics are in turn influenced by implanted maternal memory, potentially improving intelligent behavior and thus feet fitness. You do realize we're talking about seeds here. We're talking about mama seed, mama plant passing on to the baby very, uh, through the seed, different information that is going to help in that plant making a decision on their growth. Individual seeds germinate when the plethora of direct signals and maternal information reinforce each other. Germination is adaptively plastic. Intelligence is commonly held to consist of the modification of behavior in accordance with experience. In other words, one basic definition of, of intelligence is I make changes to the way I behave based on things that I know, my, my memories, my ideas, my thoughts, because those have been passed to me and how those correlate to the current conditions in which I am. Pretty, pretty simple definitions of intelligence. The complexity of germination behavior can be extraordinary and is exemplified by detailed studies of, on the wild oat. Brains are not needed for organisms to act intelligently. Commonest problem in recognizing plant intelligence is the assumption that only organisms with brain can express the behavior. Plants obviously lack a defined nervous system and the conglomerate of nerve cells that construct brains. However, they do use electrical signals for communication, as do brains. If, however, single cells are capable of intelligent behavior, then the lack of a nervous system is no longer a problem since plants are constructed from many millions of cells which already possess that capability. If then, it then becomes a matter of how cells interact to generate intelligent behavior. This section is divided into two parts. Firstly, I compare the system structure of a cell with a simple organism, uh, the, compare the systems structure of a cell with a simple organism with the recognizable simple brain. A big fancy word that I'm not going to say. Elegance, we're gonna say, because I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> Current systems investigations of the cell describe the complexity and distribution of, in, of interactions between all cellular proteins. Just as the word genome is a suitable term that summarizes and describes the haploid component of chromosomes in a single nucleus, the word interactome references the complexity and details of protein. Protein interactions in defined cells. The word connectome, so interactome, is the references the complexity and details of protein. Okay, so how proteins interact with one another inside of a defined cell. The word connectome describes the interaction complexity between neurons in a simple nervous system, like a genome and an interactome. Use of, use of the word simplifies the discussion and description, okay? The word degree is, the, is in common use in systems descriptions and refers to the number of interactions or connections either between one protein or one neuron and its interacting partners. So hopefully we're following along here so far, right? We're defining certain terms that are going to be used. Interactome is the complexity of the proteins, how the proteins are interact. Connectome is the interaction between neurons. And like genome and interactome, use the word use of the word simplifies the discussion. So we're going to simplify things a little bit more between it. We have genome, which is connected to the number of genes and how those genes interact. Interactome, which references what is happening within the protein. And then we have connectome, which is between neurons. Hopefully we're all there. There is overall system similarity between the connectome Okay, then between neurons and the interactome proteins, as indicated below. Secondly, I describe the behavior of a known single cell, Physarum polycephalum, polycephalum. Detailed investigations indicate the presence of intelligent behavior. Those observations suggest that the structure of a cell interactome protein and elangus, it's, it's actually canorhabitus, Kenorabitus, something like that, connectome, 
represent the basic necess necessary for intelligent behavior and the ability to assess signals within the context of specific environments. Behavior is then directed accordingly. Okay, let's see. How cells and nematodes process information. A system in a, is a network of mutually, of mutually dependent and thus interconnected components comprise, comprising a unified whole. Uh, eukaryotic cells contain about 100,000 protein species in both plant and animal cells once post-translational modifications are considered. These proteins interact with each other in complexes of varying size to form the dynamic network of interactome. Remember, interactome is proteins interacting. Information flow through this network can be manipulated by constructing new connections and disposing of old ones or by modifying their strength. Protein phosphorylation is a common means of manipulating connection strength. Plants and animals have about a thousand protein kinases and hundreds of protein phosphatus with differing degrees of specificity of controlling, constructing a, a phosphorylone. The system is controlled through hundreds of feedback and feed forwarding processing. All right, I'm gonna let you into a little bit of my mind process right now because we can get caught in the weeds here. Understanding exactly what each one of these terms means, if you want to go into this type of biology, by all means, go there. You go. That's not the point for our discussion. What we here are looking to do is extrapolate the main concepts and ideas that are being held in order for us to better understand how is it that our plant friends are doing things and in order for us to have intelligent conversations ourselves about the intelligence of plants. I just want to say this because if not, it's easy to get really lost in a lot of these terms. And I might just skip over some of these because what I'm trying to get to really is more of what Trawalis is trying to say to us by doing this. He is giving us all the, for lack of a better term, I hate that I'm about to use this, ammunition necessary for us to have very intelligent conversations. If you bump into somebody who tries to argue with you the physiology of all of this, you send them to this paper. But if you're like me, you're probably not going to have this conversation yourself. And that's not the point, right? What he's trying to say is what we're getting to environmental information is processed through this neural network right from the brain perspective. We know that. And it can be manipulated by changing these interactions of nerve cells increasing and decreasing and all this kind of stuff. What I am assuming he is going to get to, and I'm reading through it really quick to figure it out, is that he is going to show us how plants have developed the same basic structures using other things. Where humans and animals are brain-based or ner um, nervous system-based uh, creatures have developed it through neurons, Others have developed it through proteins. Others have developed it through other things. And more and more that we start to get to understand the physiology of many other species, we are going to find these um, complementary or similar mechanisms, but that are different in the way that they are. It's like the difference between one is driving a car, another one is riding a bike, another one is on a moped, another one is instead uh, like running. All of them are modes of transportation, right? They're all, and in the case of cars and mopeds and scooters, um, they are all modes of transportation that require some kind of external for lack of a better term, combustion or electricity. Some are going to be operating on combustion. Some are going to be operating on hydroelectric power. Some are going to be operating on electricity. They're all going to be mechanisms that are working differently, but ultimately they're all cars. And therefore cars do certain things. They all move us from place to place. What he's trying to get to right here is that he's ex explaining how even though some of these have neurons, some of these have proteins, some of those have... Um, different mechanisms, but in the end, we are all seeing a, I take information in, I process that information, I evaluate the importance and reliability of that information. This is an important aspect. I evaluate and then I make a decision because non-intelligent behaviors, what they are at, what they are saying, and this is the place where 
animal advocacy and plant advocacy often collide is that animal advocacy will try to tell you that there is no processing in the middle. I take information in, I have a chart somehow, who, know, who the hell knows where the hell this chart came from, but according to them, a chart comes in. There's a chart and the plant just does a lookup and says, okay, I get the following information, therefore I should act this way. Therefore, there is no intelligence because there is no processing of that information as an individual. This is bullshit and we know it's bullshit because we see it not just do we see it every single day, but it has been scientifically proven over and over again. But we still need long papers like this in order to get to that place. So here we are talking about this, the degrees of separation between the different um, proteins or the different neurons. We're talking about what other kinds of elements also fit into this. I am not going to go into this, but because it is not necessary. If you want to, I will always include this paper for you to read. Uh, so I'm going to look and see what is most important for us. Because here he's going into the actual biological way, the enzymes, the proteins, the all of these different pieces that create the reactions and the pathways that end up doing changes and making changes. And the fact that this is all happening is what in creates intelligence in it. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. I'm, he's going about to get to something that I do want to read. So here he's talking about intelligent behavior in the single cell. So this is the slime mold. So Physarum polycephalum is a slime mold, um, which is basically a single cell organism. Uh, let's see if this is interesting. Investigations over the last 15 years have uncovered some surprising behaviors with number of authors have identified as intelligent. That is adaptively, adaptively variable behavior during the lifetime of the individual. To follow the movement of Physarum requires the use of time lapse. The organism's behavior is largely expressed as different patterns of growth. And again, growth is slow or similar to plants. A simple maze was constructed with four possible roots differing in length and food placed at two ends. The plasmodium eventually forms a single thick tube that connects both food sources and which represents the shortest route out of the four. In other words, the cell optimizes the ratio of energy output to energy gain. Physarium is very sensitive to strong light, which damages it. By illuminating one part of the shooters. Okay. Here's the thing. It's something I've thought for a while, but I'm going to say it. I think some of these experiments that for people like Trawabas thinks, oh, this is so amazing. This is the best way we're about to show all of this in it. I think that this is actually counterintuitive and destructive to them. Here's the reason why. The fact that the yeast, not the yeast, excuse me, the slime mold is able to optimize the root in some ways, in my opinion, for the plant, for the animal advocacy people, solidifies their argument because they say it's a table lookup. They look at the most efficient way because humans, I'm going to use humans for a second, although other animals would not have necessarily picked the most efficient route. A human would have picked a route based on the memory of how their grandmother told them they got there the feelings that they had when they were on the route. There's a whole series of non-biological responses that I think people are confusing with intelligence, first and foremost. So I actually think we need to get to the heart of, I think so many of these discussions are going to go back and forth forever because we don't have the conversations. And this is what I love about NCC because here we can have this conversation. I think that the reason why the animal world, the animal is in like humans are also animal world has such difficulties is because they can state that plants can be extremely efficient, but our human behaviors are oftentimes not efficient. They are colored by our limiting beliefs and our thought processes and what was passed on from generation to generation, and depending on what you believe in, your past lives and all kinds of other things. Therefore, the more this 
biological approach tries to go through the fact of saying, look, they're doing all this efficient stuff. That means they're intelligent. I think the more this side over there is going to be like, please, if you're really intelligent, that means you have to process trauma. And I don't actually have a good answer for that yet. There's a logical side of, not a logical, well, that's not the right word either. There is a side of me that feels very strongly that plants have, do process this information. And I think that when you're offered a very simple test, I think if we were given a maze with four possible options, over time, we would find the more efficient one too. I just think we would. If you think about all the different challenges, the heroes challenges we see in mythology, um, although the hero originally tries to go at it with brute strength, eventually, and if you look at any corporation, any business, any, any project you've ever worked on, we start off by brute strength going from our own experiences and our own ways of doing things that is oftentimes clouded. But if we're left there for long enough, we will eventually find the more efficient approach. And that's what we consider to be intelligent. I think it's the same way for everybody else. I just think that they don't have as much baggage as we do. That's my belief. I think we are using these tests to try to show something that in humans, we have contaminated so much that you can no longer show the same thing. And I think that that as I read through more and more of these, that's the reason why they keep calling this habituation. I think we as humans can be habituated too. We can, I mean, we do. Our conditioning is a form of habituation. We are habituated to all sorts of things. It's just that we've been doing a lot of this stuff in a contaminated landscape for so much longer. This is my opinion. I'm totally open to whatever your thoughts are on this. And I welcome your thoughts on this. But that's the way I see it. I see that, that all of these conversations, as we're talking about intelligence, are being, are, are not taking into consideration what the animal people are really saying, which is that we as humans wouldn't have done this because psychologically speaking, we would have done stupid stuff because we're just not, we're no longer capable of, um, of operating in that way. But that's my opinion. Mm. that's my opinion so and maybe i'm wrong but that's why i think that we can't really have this conversation we can't compare apples to apples we're comparing apples and oranges and that's it's it's not going to work i think it's not going to work we're not going to convince them that they're intelligent until we deal with the cognitive pieces which is why i think that the cognitive plant cognition discussion is much more interesting today because base intelligence is is already there so he goes into habituation in mimosa pertica this is your typical study that we've read about a thousand and one times relating to galliano's research and also that was reported by bose over a century ago i actually want to pull up this book i have this bose article that i really want to go into with you um i will do that because if you don't know about chandra bose then there's a lot of stuff you're missing in relation to how we got to where we are bose is a is, is a champion and i feel like i i haven't given bose enough space here so i'm gonna i'm gonna do that um conclusion the intercom the uh, interactum and the connectum have systems similarly in their distribution of degrees among the con uh, constituents. Just as a, a system structure of the connectum provides for intelligent behavior, so does that of a cell interactum, which is the protein-based. And the intel this intelligence is confirmed with investigations on the single cell, physarium. Physarum, excuse me. Since plants are usually compound composed of millions of cells, the potential for intelligence is clearly present and is now described further. Okay, so here we're going to start getting into, hold on, sorry. I'm trying to see based on the time where we are and what exactly he's actually going to go into. The notion of plant intelligence is not new. Darwin, after much experimentation, concluded, okay, we've read all this. Sorry, hold on. I am going to zoom, zoom through this. I'm going to go really fast because I'm trying 
to see if there's anything new in it. Plants are sensitive to a whole series of different things. Here is the abiotic signals that they have to respond to, mechanical signals, uh, soil signals, vibrations. We know all of this. We've gone through this. Biotic symbol signals, okay. The signal-induced extent of phenotypic plasticity during the life cycle encompasses variations. Yes, yes, yes. This means that basically this, what he's saying in a nutshell is that even if you have two plants that come from the same mother plant that are grown right next to one another, each one of them will develop slightly differently because they react to their environment differently and they make different choices basically be between them. So plasticity, their ability to be flexible enables the individual to master its local environment and help the individual succeed in the battle to optimize fitness. Again, I think that the way that they place this and the words that they use make it seem as if this is a cause and effect and it's not it is a choice where do i choose to put more energy and i feel like you're shooting yourself in the foot trawalas in this this is my opinion only i state that over and over again um and then this is all about how they communicate which we already know plants are typically self self-organizing individuals sorry for me going through this really fast but i feel like we've heard this over and over and over and over again if you really want me to go through a deep and detailed please let me know but i i'm trying to sort of maximize all our time plants are typically self-organizing individuals there's no cell or tissue organ that has the overall view that guides the eventual phenotype Instead, organization develops from the bottom up in a kind of Markovian series. Each stage of development, a, a complex molecular state, undergoes conversation with its changing environment to which it both contributes and responds. Each stage acts as a platform for the next step. Development is thus a learning process. Okay, this is good. This is, I like this. This is true. Coordination of development change is accomplished by communication throughout. Initially, that is over short distances in a seed lane. As a system increases in size, characteristics and identity. Sorry, I'm, I'm. I get what they're trying to say. But I feel like we have to say it a different way, folks. We have to say it a different way. We have to say it a different way. We have to state much more clearly that a plant chooses which signal to respond to. I don't think that that's clear here. This is all talking about the way that the physiological response, how the body, the, the body, the plant body responds to different things in Arabidopsis, which is your typical plant that you see in laboratories that are often used. Um, the extreme tip of the root is covered by a cap with all these cells. This is what happens. These are how the cells react. Can you just state that two plants growing right next to one another do not grow the same? Because I think that that's what that's, you want to prove intelligence? We prove there. Two plants subjected to different what what is it that they have to have had different happening in their life different traumas is that can we can we make an experiment that shows that right if you have two seeds and one was traumatized and so i hate that i'm about to say this forgive me all of you okay i am trying to prove your point and i know that what i'm about to say is morally reprehensible so i apologize to all of you Two seeds, one traumatized in some way that does not physically break the seed, but that there is some trauma, extreme cold, extreme heat, something, placed in identical growing conditions, do they grow differently? If so, intelligence. One reacted in one way, the other reacted in this way. I think we need these types of experiments. We are getting to the place where this is what the animal community is expecting of this. They are expecting this types of information because this is almost proving their point. Yes, there's faster bending when you do this. Yes, when you touch, they respond. Yes, 
awareness is not under consideration here. Everybody is uh, uh, completely agrees that plants are aware, but intelligence means how I process information for a lot of people. For many people, intelligence is connected to how I make decisions. And therefore, all of these things, in my opinion, are just doubling down on the animal community to say it's biological. The responses are biological. You are showing and proving over and over again that plants react, but you're proving over and over again that it's biological. That yes, in low light conditions, they're going to grow differently than in high light conditions. But that's not the same as if I was in a low light condition for a while, then I place you in a high light condition. I still am like, mm, I don't have, I have trust issues. So I'm not going to start to grow again until I'm sure. And that's going to take me a lot longer because I don't trust you. That's to some people intelligence. And I feel like we, we, we need to start having these conversations. They're hard conversations. I don't even know how we would have these conversations, but they're the conversations that we need to have because that's what we what, what intelligence means for people processing. It means cognitive. I don't think, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I don't think we can separate intelligence from um, cognition, from psychology. I think we're trying to here, but it's not working. I mean, it, it worked. It gave us a foundation. So I think if you think about this as the foundations of plant intelligence, your foundations are there. Let's go here. 10, situations of choice and decision. The word intelligence is derived from Latin interleger, meaning to choose between a reasonable description of intelligent behavior. Okay, let's, here we go. Maybe we'll get somewhere. And motivation. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Choice and decision requires information on past behavior and the present of alternatives and critically an assessment of immediate futures enabling the beneficial choice to be made and furthering fitness. Making the less beneficial choice may have little immediate impact but will waste essential energy thus moderating fitness. The Charnov model provides a simple way of assessing efficiency of excess energy or food gained during feeding. Observations of feeding behavior in a number of animal organisms has indicated its general agreement with observation. Motivational states in goal-directed behavior, choice, and decision. A two-neuron system has been identified in the water snail, uh, limnia, limnea, that underpins decision-making during food search and consumption. Limnea performs a sophisticated form of decision-making during feed searching behavior using a core system of just two neuron types. The first reports the presence of the food and the second, the motivational state acting as a game controller for adaptive behavior in the absence of food. Once it makes a perceptual decision about the presence of the stimulus, it is often that it needs to perform, it often needs to perform further adaptive decisions to maximize the chances of achieving the goal. For example, by changing search strategy of inefficient resources, resources located. If in the face of limited resources, an important additional demand is that the goal is achieved with minimal energy expenditure. Since Amibnea is making goal-directed choices, these, com com these comments from Wrangell and Todd are also relevant. The problem can be solved by two different approaches. Animals can learn the value of each action through trial and error using reinforcement learning, and then take the action with the highest value, but this is only able to pick the optimal action on average. In another approach, animals estimate the value associated with each action in every trial using knowledge about the costs and the benefits. With sufficient knowledge, this approach often called goal-directed decision-making, can do much better since it is able to pick the optimal action at every trial. Goal-directed behavior is common in plant behavior. Daughter searching and feeding, suitable food location through both smell and taste. Observations on the plastic, on the parasitic behavior of Cuscuta, daughter, indicate it performs analogous behaviors to Linnea, but without the need for control by a simple by a simple nervous system. Daughter is a typical parasitic plant in that it searches and locates host plants, which in due course it exploits, most often tomato plants. Some 4,500 4, angiosperm species exhibit varying degrees of parasitism. 
The daughter seedling lacks a root. Consequently, you must find water quickly on germination. In this condition, it is clearly in a motivational state of search. The short uh, circumnation, cir circumnavigate, ugh, the shoot circumnavigates and locates nearby hosts from the volatile organic compounds the host emits, as shown by a time lapse. From an initial vertical cir circumnavigation of rotation, the, circumnav the circumnutation vector progressively changes to a horizontal one as the direction of the host volatiles is detected. Receptors for these volatiles clearly must, present, must be present in daughter. Motivational states of assessment in daughter of food suitability by taste. Once the suitable host is captured, daughter coils around its host and eventually develops uh, hostoria, pegs that are driven into the host's circulatory system and provides essential sustenance from the parasite. Continued parasitic success leading to flowering requires additional hosts, and the search is helped by subsequent growth and branching. If there are several hosts, and the ch thus choices in the vicinity, a decision must be made by any one branch to parasitize one host rather than the other. In the seedling stage, if the two are equidistant, say between a young tomato and a cereal plant, the seedling plumps 90% of the time for the tomato, even though the cereal does produce several chemical attractants. In the field, daughter is known to prefer certain species more than others, a choice sometimes thought to relate to how much sodium is to be found in its host. Maybe just they like each other, man. See, this is what I'm saying. We then screw ourselves over saying he has a preference, like humans have a preference, then we say, well, it's probably the sodium. Then is it really, is it, is it what? Is it the pheromones for us? Is it the amount of money somebody has? What is it that makes the choice in humans? If we find these comparisons, I think these decision, this conversation about intelligence becomes easier. Kelly offered numerous suitable hosts to daughter by tying them together and found a rejection rate of 50% within a few hours, indicated by the parasite branch growing away. The assessment period is thus completed in this short time, and since contact is only surface in character, assessment is probably made of the volatile chemical signature of the host. Daughter is using taste like Linnea and changing strategy, is changing search strategy when the source is not satisfactory. The future assessment of hosts by potential is made in these few earliest hours. By feeding potential hosts with N, rejection can be reduced by 20 to 30%, suggesting that sodium modifies host chemistry in terms of volatile organic compounds, synthesis, and food suitability. The parasite can be made a quantitative assessment of the future resources in return. A detailed time course of parasitism showed that typically the parasitic coils around its host, a processing continuum for about four days, of which then ceases, and which then ceases, and presumably controlled by feedback. Once finished, hostorial formation commences and the number of determined by the number of coils. The energy outlay here is the extent of the coiling, which the subsequent parasite, parasite growth over 28 days indicates the energy gain. By making measurements on six different hosts and plotting energy gain, energy outlay, a linear relation was observed, indicating agreement with the Sharnov model of aging for of animal foraging. Thus, daughter optimizes this crucial ratio. Estimates are made of the energy outlay in the terms of number of coils to be produced in the first few hours of contact and before any commitment to exploit. It is now not known how daughter makes these these future intelligent assessments, but they match many animal foraging assessments, but of course, without a neural system. This is a better example. This is a better example that shows a whole series of different things, especially because it can be compared to animal foraging. Now we are on the right track. Unfortunately, we're only halfway through this paper, right? We are, so as usual, we are going to have another two-parter because in an hour, you really can't get through a lot of these papers. We were on what, page eight? Page, no, eight. 10, 10, here we go. Daughter, 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 daughter. No, that's above daughter. Okay, so we're gonna stop here for a second. Well, for a week, because that's, you know, that's the way it is. We had an hour, we already went over the hour. Um, unless you tell me that eventually you want these to be longer, it takes a while to go through these papers. So we're gonna stop here and we're gonna make this a part one. I think that, well, there's so much to say. I think we're on the right track now when we're talking about 
daughter, when we're talking about this parasitic behavior, when we're talking about self intelligence, I mean, self organization and swarm intelligence. But let's see where we go from here. As I said, I think we're getting closer and closer. And this is called the foundations of plant intelligence. So I think that Chihuahuas is trying to, because he's in an academic realm and an extremely biologically centric um, field, I think it makes sense that he's trying to use the biology. I just think that we have to be careful to not shoot ourselves in the foot, to not really think of ourselves as holding ourselves back because we are trying to compare um, something that has, and we're not really showing motivation. We're showing motivation from a biological perspective and we don't think about intelligence from that perspective. We think of intelligence as taking in a lot of more emotional needs. And of course, that's really hard to show in plants. And I think that this is where we need to either break down the animal behavior differently or we need to have a different way of interacting with the plant. And the humanities, the plant humanities perspective, I think helps a lot more with this perspective of trying to, um, yeah, I think the animal humanities really does bring in a lot, animal, excuse me, plant humanities brings a lot more of motivation into it. But we are going to need to bring motivation into this if we're going to really have a true foundation of plant intelligence that's going to carry on going for the, the future. But I want to hear what you thought. So like, what did you think about what we just talked about? What direction would you like me to go in this paper or in future papers, right? As I line up, we'll what we're going to be doing over time. Please give me your feedback. Um, as soon as I post this, you're welcome to post in the comments. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts. If not, don't worry about it. We'll see each other again next week. Remember, same bat time, same bat place. We're going to meet each other to next week here in the Naturally Conscious community. And thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. And I look forward to all of your feedback. Remember, well, first of all, happy solstice, because I didn't say this. Happy whatever it is that you celebrate in this period. And may, you know, this week be amazing for you, a moment of, you know, extreme joy and happiness. And remember, more than anything, resist the urge to hold back your evolving green brilliance. So that's me, Tigre Agadena. We will see each other for part two next week. Put that on your calendar right now. Come back. Part two. Part two. Okay. See you then.